appreciate you guys coming out tonight. I hope that uh, you enjoy this presentation, get something out of it. Um, so a couple months ago, my dad sent me over this picture of me on his, like, this is actually me playing Rogue across a, two, a 1200 baud modem on a Vax 11. And I realized it was the best, like, hacker cred I could ever possibly have. <laughs> Right, so anyways, um, so this talk is about how coding isn't quite enough to be a good software developer. There's a bunch of other skills that you need to learn about, practice along the way, to really get good at this craft. Right? Um, and Steve Jobs understood this. He, there was this quote of his, this is actually taken out of a bigger quote, I'll show you in a second, but he said, technology alone is not enough. And, and here's the full quote. He said, it is in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields the results that make our hearts sing. And you can best see Steve's understanding of this in the design of the Pixar campus. And by the way, I'm going to get my phone because that's how I'm controlling the uh, presentation. I'm not like a dick, like checking my email while I'm talking to you. Although it may look like I'm a dick checking my email, I'm not really, I promise. Um, in November 2000, Jobs purchased an abandoned Del Monte canning factory 16, uh, on 16 acres in Emeryville, just no, north of Oakland. Originally, it was supposed to be split into three buildings, separate offices for the computer scientists, separate offices for the animators, and the Pixar executives. But Jobs threw the idea out and said that was a horrible idea. Instead, he made it all one space with an atrium in the center. He knew the most important function of a company was the interaction of its employees. And the more opportunity you give them to have that interaction, the better. And it also wasn't good enough just to make this a central space. You had to give them a reason to go there. Right, so that's why he put things like mailboxes, meeting rooms, the cafeteria, coffee in these places to give them reasons to have these interactions did a game room, and this was all built in shared space. He insisted that the best creations occur when people from disparate fields are connected together to focus on a singular problem. Since 1995, when Pixar released Toy Story, they released 12 films. Each averages over 500 million per film. Jobs knew that the best innovations didn't come from just the technology. Technology alone isn't enough. And it's not all about the interaction either. There's a lot more to it, especially in our field, being software developers. So I'm going to be going through sort of 12 principles, and they're all over the place, just things that I've found as I've worked as a programmer, as I've built up NV Labs, 12 things you need to be aware of and need to get better at as a software developer to be really good at your craft. And some of these are going to be obvious, and some of them might not be so obvious. So bear with me, hopefully you'll find something useful. So the first thing that I find over and over again is even the most experienced developers are afraid of setting expectations or taking or doing estimates, right? Oh, and that's my other bad habit. Every, feel free to, to, to like point at me every time I say right, because that's, that's what I'm currently dealing with as my, uh, you know, trying to get better as a speaker. I think it's because when you ask people a question and you're, you're, you're like in an audience like this, it's going to be very hard for me to do any sort of interaction. Although if you have a question, raise your hand and comment, yell it out, but still. But if you say right and you look at somebody, right, odds are they're going to let, yeah, they're going to nod your head and you get that positive feedback. But I need, I need to stop that. So really, I say estimation is hard, kind of like riding a bike. It's something that when you first looked at, it looked really intimidating, it's really scary, you're going to fall on your ass a couple times before you get it right, and really it leads to a lot of project failure, bad, ex uh, bad estimation. There's so many times these projects can fail because of it. Right? So, and then did it again, this is the right account, I'm going to try to stop that right now. Um, so another way you can get better at setting expectation is to bring the client closer to the team. What does that mean? Well, it means checking in with the client more often. There's some consulting teams that actually have the client, they're required to 
to work there with the developers because it's going to help with communication and expectation. All right, yeah, client with the team. Also, um, things like short feedback cycles. So as I was building NB Labs, I realized one of my goals was to figure out what is the most transparent way and honest way to, work to construct a consultancy, to do consulting work. And part of that was scheduling weekly meetings with the clients. So every Monday morning, 10 o'clock, on the dot, we talked with this client, whether we did 10 hours of work or 60 hours of work. But because we forced ourselves to communicate and set expectation often, it worked out pretty well. And we still do that to this day. We always, on a weekly basis, communicate with our clients, because most of them are remote. Also, with setting expectation, using the right project management tool. And I'm not going to tell you there's one tool that's the best. It really depends on your project. Um, some people like more of the Kanban style, maybe something like Trello or what is it, Agile Zen, or Pivotal Tracker. And then sometimes it's better to use something that's more ticket-based, like GitHub issues, for example. But I think each project kind of demands some different strategy depending on what you're doing. OK, number two, the second thing you need to keep in mind, be mindful of your engineering background. What, what do I mean by that? Well, really, when it comes to people who are analytical, who solve problems, when somebody comes to you with a problem, are you the kind of person that first thinks of all the reasons why it's going to fail? I know that's how I think. I first like to disqualify things. Unfortunately, that means that people don't always like telling me their ideas. The only problem with this is that this kills collaboration. Right? Because what you're basically doing, when someone comes to you an idea and you think through it, the first thing that you do is tell them, here's the five reasons it's going to fail, is it sounds like you're diagnosing the problem. And diagnosis sounds like criticism. And criticism kills innovation. Um, this is a quote from Charles Schwab. I've been getting into some more of the business books, and I found this really good quote. In my wide association in life, meeting with many and great people in various parts of the world, I have yet to find a person, whatever great or exalted in his station, who did not do better work and put forth greater effort under a spirit of approval than would ever do under a spirit of criticism. Right? So criticism or diagnosis can kill innovation. So beware. Beware of giving diagnosis, especially when you're not asked to, especially when somebody is brainstorming with you. There's this uh, sort of improv practice. If you ever get a chance to do one of these like business improv practices like classes, I highly recommend them. They're great. And one of the exercises that I've seen over and over again is this yes and exercise, where you practice. Somebody says, you know, hey, I've got an idea. It's like Reddit meets, you know, Twitter, and your job is to say yes, and it would be great if it had a forum. And the next person, yes, and it'd be great if it was blue and white, right? So the objective is simply to add somebody's idea when they're brainstorming, rather than to immediately diagnose or criticize. So when people tell me ideas, and they're strictly ideas, and try to shut off that part of my brain that wants to tell them why it's a stupid idea because it doesn't scale, and simply play along with them and help add to their idea. The other thing that developers sometimes aren't the greatest at, um, I find, because maybe we're introverts, maybe we're a little shy, is giving people our full attention, and it's something that I've definitely been working on a lot more. And when I think about this, I think of this guy. This is Derek Sivers. I've had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times. He was the founder of CD Baby. And when he's in the room and somebody is talking to him, he is 120% focused. You all have probably somebody in your life that comes to mind when you think of somebody who gives you their full attention. And all of a sudden, you find yourself saying all sorts of things and spewing all sorts of information because simply they're attentive, right? Paying attention, listening, not judging. Um, so please be mindful of that as well. Now, you might be shy, and it's just not um, sort of intuitive of you to do that, but it's important to shut off your brain when people have an idea and they're communicating to you. The other thing is that, that I need to get better at, especially at my gig, especially at, at a pace when you're working at fast pace like people do here in New York, is they have a really bad habit of interrupting people. That's the other thing I've got to get better at myself. So be mindful of your engineering background. And um, 
and diagnosing problems when they're not meant to be diagnosed. Number three is to remember that software development is an art form. Now, I realize when I wrote this, I like to think of it as an art form, but really, software development is not an art form. Software development is a craft. What's the difference between the two? Well, a craft means making useful objects with perhaps decorative touches. Fine art means making things purely for their beauty. And yet, somehow, when good user interface design comes together with good branding, comes together with good code, we can somehow build something that we would call beautiful. I've seen it. I've seen it lots of times at code school. We have a course that has beautiful design and user interface and a nice jingle. And uh, we put it all together with challenges. And I would definitely call it beautiful work. And really, that's kind of your job as a software developer, is to take whatever canvas you're given, no matter how ugly it is, and figure out some way to turn it into something that you might call beautiful. And I usually try to insert at least one rant in my talk. And this, this is the dump where I start talking about how I get a little pissed off, especially in the Rails community. I think it's gotten better. I haven't heard it as much these days. But there used to be this whole thing about how products and creating your own products is the sort of golden pot at the end of the rainbow. That's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing consulting. And so we can stop doing that and we can build products and create a start. And that's what we're trying to do. But the bottom line is when it comes to doing software development, consulting and building somebody else's product is in many cases more challenging than creating your own product and scratching your own itch. Right? Especially if it's a product that you have no domain knowledge in, that you have no passion for, right? that you need to break new ground. Right? Consulting takes a whole other set of skills to pick up somebody else's domain, to figure out the innovative solutions to build it correctly. Um, right, And doing this shouldn't be seen as any less glamorous. Scratching your own itch is easy. You see it over and over again in our, in our community where people create all these project management tools. That's what they do. They scratch their own itch. Doing that is a lot easier. It's a lot harder and more challenging to work in a domain you have no familiarity with. Um, right, so I want to challenge, scratch, scratch somebody else and it's not your own. Now, I, I live in Orlando, Florida, and I take my kids to Disney World a lot. I enjoy taking them there. We go around, I've got a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, the seven-year-old boy is named Ender. We're really stoked about the movie coming out. <laughs> uh, you know what, so you know where the name came from. But I was walking along at Disney uh, the other day, and I, I saw this quote. I thought it really fit really well. You don't build it for yourself. You know what the people want, and you build it for them. Right? And as a software developer, that's your job, is to figure out how you can take other people's problems and, through your craft, create innovative solutions. All right, so that's number three. Number four, learn how to delegate and improve the system. So when I first started building the business, I picked up this book, The E-Myth. Who here has read this? This is like the typical business book. A couple people in the room. Um, you don't have to read it unless you want to start a business. But um, what it talks about is that all good businesses come down to a series of systems. That's why people buy franchises is because it comes with a manual that tells you how all the different systems work. All the systems are documented, right? So really, your job as you advance in your career is to identify these systems inside your company and figure out how you can get them to work for you and improve the system. That's how you become more valuable as an employee, right? Um, it could be something like touching base with your clients once a week. That was one system that we put in place that helps our business grow. Um, I also realized, as I was building my consultancy, um, that there is these people that not only enjoy project management, right, what was I going to say? They not only are, they're good at project management, not only are they good at organizing things, they're better than you, but they actually enjoy it. They're called project managers. And I will never live without them ever again, because obviously as I started building a business, 
um, to doing consulting work, I quickly got overwhelmed with the amount of administrative work that I had to do. And I will never live without them. Um, with doing things like scheduling meetings, writing expectations, invoicing, organization, and all of a sudden I was saving so much time per week. If I just figured out, forced myself, what is the system? What can I possibly delegate? So, really, if you want to be spending more of your day coding, and less of your day doing that administrative stuff, right? figure out what you can hand off to other people else. And there's, there's this sort of program, I call it sort of the engineer's dilemma, which looks a little bit something like this. Just because you can do something does not mean you should. If something is on your plate and you are capable of it, very often developers will just do it without a second thought. But really, is there somebody else at your team that perhaps is better at that? There's somebody who enjoys that more than you? Maybe you can delegate. Um, I also encourage people to do the math, right? Let me give you an example. So at this, uh, we, we used to share space with a company named Boxeo. They were a bigger company, we rented space from them in Orlando. And Boxeo had a full-time professional barista on staff which sounds very lucrative at first, and still, until, we not very lucrative, very, I don't know, posh, very fancy, but until you start doing the math. So let's say they had about 80 people. Some people are gonna drink two cups a day, so let's on average, let's say on average, everybody drinks one cup a day. When they go to get coffee, they have to get up, they have to walk over, maybe they go downstairs, they take the elevator down to Starbucks, they get their Starbucks, they come back to the elevator, they go up, and they go back to the seat, and try to get back in the zone. So that's maybe 15 minutes wasted a day, right? Do the math, that's 1,200 minutes, that's 20 hours wasted. So if we hired a barista for eight hours, who's probably you know, cheaper than most of our you know, software developers to get you know, to be employed, we're, gonna be, we're actually gonna be saving money if we can keep people in the zone and we can make them copy and maybe even bring it to them at their desk. We'll be making money. So, that's just one small example about doing the math. If you had 10 more hours of programming in a week, right, just 10 more hours, that would easily pay to have an administrator or an admin or somebody to answer your emails, right? Now, I know some of you guys, oh, but I'm not running my own business. I'm not planning on running my own business. How does this, what does this have to do with, for me, right? Well, even if you're a small cog in a big machine, um, the solution, right, isn't always, you know, hiring somebody, right? And it all comes back to, as I mentioned earlier, trying to figure out if somebody does a task better than you, if somebody enjoys doing something more than you do, right? And I always, I always put it in con this sort of context. Everything that you do during the day either gives you energy or takes it away. And it's your job so you can be happy to do more of the stuff that gives you energy. And even amongst programmers, you're gonna find some programmers that love the front end bit, right? And maybe they love doing the back one, plugging it in. Maybe somebody loves doing the APIs. Maybe somebody loves doing e-commerce. If you can identify what people enjoy doing the most and make sure that they have those tasks, they're gonna be happier and they're probably gonna do them better and, and faster. Right? Um, there's this, you know, when you look at all the self-help books, right, they talk about things like first Independence and interdependence. That what you, that's what you should be working towards is interdependence. First, independence of yourself, sufficient, that you're self sufficient, and then evolving to the place where you rely and rely on people, that you can delegate to people and count on them to get the job done. All right, so learn how to delegate and improve the system. Um, the most valuable employees help improve the business, not just code. Number five, I'm gonna take a drink of coffee over here for a second. I'll let you look at the pretty picture. All right. Number five, this is a bit obvious, but there's gonna be some things in here that you might not have heard of before. Continue to learn inside and outside your company. So what can you do inside your company? Well, at MB Labs, we very often have internal presentations. This could be stuff like that somebody presented to Ruby user group, and maybe at lunch we bring them together and everybody teaches everybody. Um, book club is pretty popular. If we find a good book that we all want to go through, we basically do one or two chapters a week, and then we all go grab lunch, we come back, 
and um, discuss the chapter. Obviously, pair programming is a good habit, and that's how people get better. If you got somebody on your team who's an amazing developer, and they work by themselves all the time, that is such a waste of a resource. Right. Um, right. So that's how that's the easiest way to take those amazing expert programmers and get them to decipher their knowledge. It's such a waste if you have amazing programmers and they're not pair programming with other people to sort of dispense the knowledge. Also, one way I think you can get better inside your company is make sure you're eating with people inside your company. Um, it's scientifically proven that you are more likely to like somebody if you eat with them more often. So that's why um, there's that book out there with Never Eat Alone. I always try to have lunch with people inside my company. And we also do a tradition on Fridays. Every Friday we cater lunch. Sometimes we'll do an internal presentation. Sometimes we'll just hang out. And it's those types of things that really can build your team together. Um, oh, screencasts. So we've got a big culture around screencasts. Obviously, I'm a huge screencast guy. Um, but what we started doing very early on in our consultancy um, is every Friday, we would create a, not only, not only would we deploy our work to the staging server to show our client, but we would also create a five minute screencast to show them what we've done. Because the people you're creating software for, they're busy people too. The odds of them, like, Figure, you're trying out that feature that's like 10 levels deep, that you have to have two users' accounts that you worked on, that they're really going to test it all out like you really want and somewhat need them to, is close to nil. But if you create a five-minute screencast and show it to them, they're going to watch it. So we started doing that with our clients, and they absolutely love it. Because not only will they watch the screencast, but they'll send it to five other people. They'll send it to their investors. They'll keep it around. Heck, they might even use it as documentation to teach other people how to use the system. And what's cool about those five-minute screencasts, well, and first of all, I want to also say that we use Jing. Jing is an amazing tool for doing this, and I would never use any other tool. Jing is sort of like Twitter for screencasts. It forces you to only keep things to five minutes, and there's no editing. No editing allowed. Um, because, you know, engineers sometimes we're perfectionists and you want to get the screencast just right and you might edit a five-minute screencast for an hour and we just don't allow that. So use Jing, do one take, it shouldn't take you longer than 20 minutes to put it all together. You get it all set up and you can go. Um, but what's also cool about these five-minute screencasts is that every other Friday after lunch, we get together and every team has to submit one of their screencasts that they might have shown to a client. And in our big company, we watch all these screencasts. And that's how we get to stay on the same page. We have a team of now 33 people. And there's no way everyone's going to be aware of what everyone's working on. But we put together a bunch of these five-minute screencasts. And they're so much fun to watch as a group. And you get to go home on, everyone gets to go home on Friday with a good feeling that they know what's going on in the company. And they might know who to go to when they need to implement a feature. Because they saw that the other guy worked on that in a project you know, a few weeks back. So that's worked out really well for Envy Labs. We have a lot of fun um, watching our screencasts on Fridays. Also, nobody does retrospectives enough when it comes to a learning inside a, inside a company. You know, I've never met a company that does it enough. And what, in case you're not familiar, retrospective simply means taking the time after a project is done to have a meeting and say, OK, what went well, and what didn't go well, and how can we make sure it gets, we do all the better next time? No company spends enough time doing that. If you can schedule time to do that, um, you know, you're going to learn a lot. It's a great way to learn, like right after you're done with the project, taking the time to figure out how you can improve. OK, so that's learning inside your company, learning outside your company. Some of these are obvious. There's a point there was a website that you can learn outside your company. Um, also, uh, I do the Ruby 5 podcast. Anybody here listen to Ruby 5? A couple of you guys. So this is a twice weekly Ruby news podcast where we cover the latest news in the Ruby and Rails community. And you know, it's something that you can listen to when you know, you're doing laundry, uh, commuting to work, mowing your lawn, washing your cat, whatever. Um, also, of course, going to conferences, going to meetups like this um, are pretty useful. You guys live in a great city to get access to all the great educational content going on here. Um, well, obviously, users groups like this one is fantastic. Um, I run the Ruby users group here. There's lots of great, you guys have access to so many great resources here. 
events like bar camp, where you sort of cross pollinate between different disciplines. Um, and let's just uh, move on. So after learning, number six would be stay out of your comfort zone. And I added this slide to this presentation recently because I think it's really important to stay out of your comfort zone. What do I mean by that? Well, you're going to go to work tomorrow and you're going to have a task list, right? A bunch of tasks in front of you. Some of them are going to be easy and some are going to be difficult. And because they're difficult, you're probably going to be a little scary and maybe even risky. But at the end of the week, looking back, which tasks do you think you will learn the most from? The easy ones or the difficult, scary ones? Probably the difficult, scary ones. The difficult tasks are usually the ones that you keep on learning, that you keep on improving. So you really need to keep that in mind. The problem is that as humans, we naturally gravitate towards the easy. A good example of this is the email track. People, you know, when it comes to email, email is such an easy way to get that quick feeling of gratification and getting stuff done. You get that quick little squirt of endorphins every time you go through, you answer an email and send. It's one of those easy tasks that you can do and feel productive. But are you really learning anything? Not really. So you want to learn the most when you work, right? Stay out of your comfort zone. Understand that it's the scary, risky tasks that feel uncomfortable, that give you, are going to probably give you the most reward and you're going to learn the most from. So number seven, make friends and build relationships. Oh, happy joy. Um, really. Um, individuals and interactions over processes and tools from the Agile Manifesto. And then I don't have to tell you about it. You know, obviously, you know, there's been lots of scientific psychology studies about how the more friendships you have, the more support you have, and the people around you, the happier you're going to be. The happier you're going to be, the better work you're going to do. Right? So, that kind of begs the question, how much time do you spend at work nurturing friendships? Because when it comes down to it, one way you can make everyone around you better is actually to become a better friend. If you want to be a more valuable employee, Maybe you need to be that support system. So it's if people don't value that enough, we value the code, must code, but really there's a lot to be said for solidifying the relationships you have with the people you work with. Because if you have those friendships, you're gonna be happier, they're gonna be happier, and you guys are gonna do better work together. Um, one way you can make the Ruby community better, or the New York City Ruby community better, is to make more friends. Lots of people here you probably don't know. And don't, I'm not going to make you all stand up and meet your neighbors, don't worry. Probably should have done that. Okay. Um, people love to, oh yeah, so this is so, but, so people wonder like, um, but wait, I don't, what am I, what am I going to say? I don't, I, hello, my name is, I don't know, what are you going to say? And I don't, oh, I, I don't, there's, there's a secret to talking and to people, and that is simply this. People love talking about themselves. That's all you have to know, right? So you introduce yourself. Sorry, this seems obvious, but it's not always obvious. You introduce yourself, and I'm great. Oh, where are you from? What do you do? That's all you have to do. And you'd be surprised. People love talking about themselves. Um, I always try to challenge people on some of these talks, set a goal. So if I were to give you guys a goal or a mission after this talk is over, your, your mission is to meet five new people right here. Maybe you'll connect to somebody, maybe you'll give you a job. Who knows? So that's number seven, make friends and relationships. Don't worry, um, it'll get better. I have no idea why this Russian unicorn is impaling this guy. <laughs> but it's, uh, well, is, it, is that a Russian or Soviet unicorn to be accurate? That's what I thought, it's a Soviet unicorn. I say that wrong. Um, I, I like, yeah, yeah. Don't be afraid to ask for help, especially if you have a unicorn chasing you. Um, so this comes down to really, okay, there you are working your task, you're working on it, you ask, okay, it's gonna take me two hours to get done. Um, yeah, okay, uh, you're going, you're starting to go over the two hours, should you ask for help? No, you're already two hours in, so now, okay, well, four hours later, you're still working on it. Damn it, you're already over. 
Should you keep going and finish it? I don't know. No, you know. This is probably half. Eight hours later, you're like, I'm going to do it. I'm fucking going to do it. I'm sure you've all been there. So, like, what would have happened if you would have asked for help after those two hours? Obviously, right, maybe you would have been done in three hours, but there's this confidence thing that goes on there that we don't want to ask for help after we get involved, right? And of course, it's better to fail after two hours or fail after eight hours. So if it takes you eight hours to do something, um, maybe you're doing it wrong, or maybe there's something you don't know. It's totally natural that once you've committed to doing something and you're going to do it yourself, then you're a lot less likely to ask for help or even give up. Let me show you an example. Let's say that somewhere in the world, there's this country that needs help, but it has an evil dictator. Well, we'll call it, the country will call it her Pakistan. And we have this evil dictator that looks somewhat like David Hasselhoff. And he is uh, suppressing his people, doing all sorts of horrible things, so, well, let's, okay, we'll send the troops in. Okay, there we go. And uh, it's not going so good, it feels like you're not, you might lose. Oh, do we consider giving up? No, oh, we put it, oh, no, we keep on, we're going to double down. Once we are involved with it, we're trying to, when it's much harder to ask for help and maybe admit defeat. Now, I wasn't trying to make a political commentary there, but if you thought I was trying to make it, and you think that's cool, then I was. Otherwise, I wasn't. <laughs> Um, right. So it's human nature that once you're involved in something that you um, kind of don't want to give up. I try to tell the developers that work for me, um, give yourself 30 minutes. If you have a problem that's been difficult, that's giving you a hard time, don't struggle with it for longer than 30 minutes. Give yourself that time window, and if you can't figure it out, ask for help. And as I said earlier, if something's taking too much time, you're probably doing it wrong. So who do you ask? Maybe it might be the coworker, and we might ask somebody to pair program with you. Maybe it could be Twitter, your user group mailing list, your code crew, right? You guys are here to support each other, right? Ask them, ask each other. Um, you can also preempt the problem, which I try, we try to do at NB Labs. I encourage my employees um, to look at their task list. Identify at the beginning of the week which tasks are going to be the most risky, the most challenging, and maybe ask at that point, who wants to pair with me on this task? So preempt the issues by identifying harder tasks and maybe pairing. Or maybe even just having a meeting to flesh out the architecture. Also, every nine. And by the way, nobody told me how long this talk was supposed to be. Is there, is there a time we're supposed to end? Anyone? Fine. fine. Okay. We're almost done. We're about, about two thirds, if not more through it. Um, Number nine, to get better at being a software developer. Learn to eliminate distractions and get in the zone, right? It's, but, you know, we're all trying to do that. We all need to eliminate distractions. But also, it's important to understand that it's not natural to be productive 100% of the time. And this is something I have to tell my employees, like, every month or two, because it's really important that they understand that. Optimally, you're having at work about 20% fun doing whatever, and about 80% productivity. That's probably about right. So the other thing that kills me, as somebody who, like, I, I never aims to be a founder of a company, but they, here I am. And then, and, but, but what kills me more than anything is when I walk over to a developer or a designer, and I go over to tell them something, and I look up at their screen, and they close Facebook real quick. <laughs> Part of me just, dies inside <laughs> when I see that. Because there is nothing worse than having to like fear that boss thinking you're goofing off. And so I just, I always, every like month I have to say, I don't care what you're doing. I don't expect you to work 100% of the time. Go on Facebook, watch videos, have fun. As long as you're meeting client or a customer's expectation, I don't care. Hair. Um, and yeah, it's, but that, yeah, it's important. It's also important to um, that you know, in the work environment, to give people opportunities to take breaks. Do things you know, like ping pong on this break. We do things like you know, video games, stuff like that. So giving people those opportunities for opportunities is great. Also, to, to sort of stay in the zone. Besides giving yourself breaks, obviously, and this is obvious, turning off communication. That's something that I know I still need to get better at as far as turning off email, turning off. Twitter, turning off IM, 
so that you can really focus on your work. Asynchronous communication, leveraging that in the right way. So what does that mean? It means like when I need to talk to somebody and tell them something, I say, okay, how urgent is this? Okay, well, I don't have to go over and tap on their shoulder. Can I send them an IM? Is it even that important? No, probably not. Okay, I'll send them an email. So try to be really conscious about communication like that. If you don't need to interrupt somebody, and you can tell they're over in there in the zone, for God's sake, don't interrupt them. That goes for anybody. Also, I, I like alternative workspaces. I kind of feel if I'm in the same space for you know, all week, I don't like it. That's why you know, at Indie Labs, we let people, if you want to work from home Tuesdays, Thursdays, please do, or from a coffee shop. Um, we also provide places around work, like you know, that, you know, like uh, couches and hammocks that you can go and work in. Um, <laughs> that's not my all business work. But I love post-it notes. There's something about writing down physically like a task list that keeps you more productive. Having that at the beginning of the day, spending the time to write down everything you need to get done, and then taking the time then and there to prioritize, I've seen it work really effectively at you know, helping people get things accomplished. Right? There's stuff like getting things done, of course, and that you know, helps. Also, there's like systems for staying more productive, like Pomodoro, if you have you know, check it out. You might want to check it out. It basically gives you uh, a timer where you take, what is it? Is it 20 minutes, 10 minutes? What is it? Somebody knows it. 25 minutes and then five minutes off. All right, so it gives you a timer. So you're 25 minutes, you're focused. Five minutes, you're doing something else. Reading a book, having fun. And you go back and focus. Um, some people think that's helpful. So that's learn to eliminate distractions and get in the zone. And I want to know if somebody's done this yet. I haven't heard of it. But I swear, like, next time, you know, I start a company and we have some money to start it, I think I'm going to buy everybody, like, $200 noise-canceling Bose headphones, right? So people can, you know, are going to be more likely to stay in the zone, not get distracted. Like, and I want to see, like, how quickly I'm going to get, I'm going to get back the money that I spent on those really goddamn expensive headphones. So I think you get back your money really quick in productivity. Number 10, the most complex solution is rarely the best solution. And as much as I hate to say it, sometimes a solution is WordPress. <laughs> afraid so. Um, right. So what do I mean by that? I mean, that, you know, WordPress is a good out-of-the-box solution. It does a lot for a lot of people. It's a good content management solution. And you shouldn't over-engineer. And as developers, we're really good at over-engineering. We've done this a million times with like Code School. At Code School, we uh, said we realized, okay, we're going to create lots of products in the next few years, right? So let's create a billing system. Because at the time, there wasn't anything that did exactly the way we wanted to. Yeah, let's create a recurring billing system. Yeah, we'll do it, and it will be like a multi-tenant thing. So like every time we create a product, it'll use that one billing system. How many tenants do you think are in our billing system? Fucking one for the last three years. Because we were like, yeah, we'll use it, we'll over-engineer. Oh, yeah. So that was, that was horrible, but we're engineers. So we're like, yeah, we'll just do it. It'll be a little more complex, but eventually we'll need it. We'll need it. <laughs> Keep it simple. So yeah, be mindful of that as well. Um, the other thing you can do to be a better software developer is communicate better than everyone else. Um, this is a quote from the guy I work with. Creating quality software is X percent code and Y percent communication, where Y is greater than X. That's what it comes down to. It's about the communication skills, which is why sometimes people come up to me and they say, is code school going to replace the colleges and computer science programs someday? And I'm just like, no, you don't even get it. Not at all, because really what you get when you go into one of those programs, or you go to you know, Flatiron School around here, or you know, General Assembly stuff, is you learn the communication part, which is just as important as the coding part, thus this presentation, right? So, really, so how can you communicate better? I mean, here's like, um, well, well, first, let me mention, this is a really interesting thing in Rework, so great book. Um, what's interesting in there is they say, 
high grade writers. If you've got two candidates that are applying for the same job, look at their writing skills and see who writes better. Because great writers know how to communicate. They know how to make things easy to understand. They can put themselves into someone else's shoes. Clear writing is a clear sign, uh, is, a, is a sign of clear thinking. So if you can communicate more effectively as a writer, you're going to be a more effective worker. They knew that. So how do you communicate more effectively? Well, you can do things like, of course, you know, leverage the right project management tool. Make sure you're using something that works well on your team. Also, force yourself to communicate. Like I talked about earlier, put processes in place that force you on a weekly basis to do things like check in with your client, check in with your team, ask things how things are going, do project planning, do estimation. Even if you don't have a client, do estimation for the sake of doing it so you don't get out of track. Um, right. Also, and probably the most useful thing, if you take anything away from this talk, it's use things like Jing. Now, I used to say Skitch. Skitch was awesome until it got acquired by Evernote, and then I think it kind of sucks for a couple reasons. Um, I won't go into it. But recently, if you're on a Mac, I really dig Monosnap. It does the same sort of thing. Basically, where you, know, you can take a screenshot and you can annotate it. If you're on a PC, just use Jing. Jing allows you to do both the screen sharing, the screen casts, and the screenshots. So when it comes down to it, all I'm trying to say is communicate through images and video, not words. If there's any way that you can communicate through videos and images, do it. You shouldn't, and, and what's, what's pretty amazing sometimes, sometimes we'll train our clients. You should train all your clients and all your project managers and anybody who needs to communicate with you expectations or QA, they should all know how to use Jing. They should all know how to use screencasts. Because I can tell you that, that that first time that a client sent me a screencast, they were like, look, see on the system when you do this, this happens, we need to fix this. Yes, my work here is done, drop the microphone, go home, right? Um, so if you can train the people around you to better communicate using tools like screens, you know, like screenshots and video, it's gonna be it's gonna be really innovative and you're gonna get better at your job. You're gonna be the most if you can communicate with the people around you and screenshots and, and and uh, screencasts, you're going to be the most valuable employee easily, very quickly, because you're going to communicate better than everybody else. All right, number 12, this is the last one. The 12th thing you can do as a software developer is to try to understand what will bring you happiness and what gets you, gives you energy. Because when it comes down to it, people aren't usually good at choosing what will make them happy. It's not money. There's been lots of studies that prove you know, people win the lottery and a year later they're just as happy as anyone else. It's not fame that's going to make you happy, or should I say it's not fame that's going to make you happy. Uh, he's not as famous as he used to be, I guess. Um, it's not only, right, so it's not fame, it's not money, it's not only the code, it's not your tools that are going to make you happy. Right? Technology alone is not enough. What I think it comes down to is doing meaningful work. And how do you do meaningful work? Well, everyone wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And I'll give you 10, or I'll give you 11 ways you can do more meaningful work. You can find more meaning in the work that you can do. You can do things like set expectations. <laughs> be mindful of your engineering background. Understand that software development is a craft. Learn how to delegate better. Continue to learn inside and outside your company. Stay out of your comfort zone. Remember the most uncomfortable and scary tasks are very often going to be the ones that you learn the most from and you grow the most from. Make friends and build relationships because really it's those relationships that will also bring you happiness. Don't be afraid to ask for help and look out for soul be it unicorns. Um, learn to eliminate distractions and get in the zone. Realize that the solution sometimes is word pros. Communicate better than everyone. And, and lastly, communicate better than everybody else, really. And each of these can help you do better work. Each of these can help the people around you do better work. And each of these can create more meaning in the work that you do. And hopefully, bring you a little more happiness. And that's
that's my talk. Thank you.